Okay. That, that's great, Paul. It's just we're, there's so much to be said. All these people, but Mark, uh, Mark Applebaum is going to be our next speaker, and he's also going to speak briefly about whatever topic you would like related to notation. Thank you, Neely. Um, since Lee, you also wrote the uh, new new Val Aventure. Maybe you could rename re re your piece like VL Aventure or something like that. <laughs> Put that piece in the middle there. Okay, so. Um, I, I also, what I'd like to do is say something about the piece that's going to be performed tonight, and then I'd also like to formulate um, uh, a somewhat incompetent and possibly even untoward thesis that's a response to today's very interesting and provocative papers. It, so um, the, which, there's some, some musings that are on my mind in response to earlier today. So the piece tonight is called Medium, and um, it, yeah, I guess I'll mention that um, it's the first piece in which uh, uh, that is a, a kind of a graphic notation of mine in which there's no um, in instruction whatsoever about how to interpret the graphics. I had done a lot of hybrid pieces before that in that the sort of derivation were a series of concerti that I wrote with various ensembles. The last two, uh, one ensemble was the Belgian group Sean Baxon, and the, the other one was um, New York-based Meridian Arts Ensemble. And these were pieces for those ensembles playing more or less determinate, uh, quote, determinate uh, sort of um, no, um, ideas against which I was free to improvise on a sound sculpture um, that, I, that I'd invented. And what I did is I realized that I wanted to have a trace in notation of what I was doing for potential other players who can play on any instrument. And so I started coming up with these weird glyphs and these pictographs that I, that I idealistically and maybe naively thought were representative of the kind of whimsy and it, the type of invention, the type of lack of symmetry, the kind of balance between rectilinear and sort of more circular things. So um, that, and, and, and the instruction that accompanies that, gr those graphics and those hybrid scores, those pictographic bits, is to interpret them rigorously, <coughs> consult them casually, or ignore them entirely. Um, the, the idea being that they shouldn't be an impediment to a creative musician, if it is simply a resource um, to assist them. Um, so this piece is the uh, medium is the first one that um, that moves uh, to exclude that, that isn't a hybridized sort of uh, standard canonic Western Eurocentric uh, notation with pictographs. This one is just the glyphs. But one of the things I, I subscribe to the school that says that improvisation and composition are actually more similar than they are different. And that really there's just um, a very tricky temporal sort of um, aspect that notionally or conceptually divides them. Um, and where we put that division is um, is contextual and difficult for two people to agree on, maybe. But um, in this piece, I for the one tonight, I forbid improvisation. This is an ongoing pet peeve of mine, um, which is when people see non-standard notations, they think that it automatically invites improvisation. And it doesn't, it, and, it, and it can. And in fact, you can look at a Beethoven score and you can impro improvise a system of assignation of, of um, uh, symbols to musical gestures or s s sonic results. I mean, you could just like spontaneously decide that you see an F, which might mean forte to somebody, and you could decide that that means a pitch class F. Clearly, that would not have a kind of fidelity to the culture in which Beethoven inhabits, and we understand that, and so it, it, it's, I suppose, correct to say that that would be an incorrect rendering. But I still think it's interesting that you could improvise an, um, your system of how you're uh, interpreting a notation. And conversely, you can look at a non-standard, a, um, a, a unique system, as is the case of medium, which is a, or a, a unique notation, which isn't a system, and you can decide in a non-improvisational manner in advance with a tremendous amount of discipline what those things mean. It's just that your system is personal and going to be different than another interpreter. But I am interested in the idea that players in this particular piece would spend time um, with the score in advance. Uh, also, this, the last thing I'll say about the, the, um, this piece is that um, a, a small bit of it ended up on the t-shirt for this conference, and that's just tremendously gratifying, just in the sort of narcissistic um, impulse. It's nice to, it's just satisfying to see other people wearing this, this a little bit of this, so that's kind of nice. Um, 
the, the, if I may, the thesis, the, the idea that I want to, um, that, and this is sort of like ill-formed, so don't take this as some sort of like uh, competent and, and fully um, thought out response. But I was thinking that rules, we don't have a flat landscape of rules, and I think that that's something that needs to be unpacked. So a rule is not a rule is not a rule. And perhaps the notion of autonomy itself is really best thought of on a kind of a continuum. Um, so the um, so what I wanted what I was thinking about is my daughter um, who's seven years old and she loves to make activity books uh, or I call them activity books and these are things where she gives you she, she makes these things up every morning and sometimes she slips them under the door of our bedroom and we wake up and we find these things that say like decode these letters unscramble these letters or here is how you draw a fish um, and then she has like a step-by-step -step thing. And then she puts a, what's important, she puts a box that says, now you draw your own fish here. And then sometimes she has like a house and then you choose the colors and things like that. And I realized that um, this, is, this is a provocation to others. It, it, you could think of it as a provocation, a puzzle, an invitation, a challenge, an opportunity. And I was thinking about um, the, the observation in Alex Waterman's paper about how Robert Ashley expresses delight at making music with Pauline and how much fun he had in doing that. And I think that that's a great thing to aspire to. And I, uh, I falter sometimes in, in this, my ability to enjoy this myself. But I feel like, like my daughter, I feel like I make activity books. I present something, a provocation to players as a chance for them to have fun, that kind of fun that Ashley described, to, to learn something, maybe to experience something, to enable an expression, etc. And this is presuming that they're actually inclined to take on the, this challenge or this provocation. And as was clear in uh, Matthew's um, discussion of the, the old ladies for whom Ives' songs are not written, Okay? It reminds us that not all music has to be for everyone. This is a kind of cottage industry thing. There's just a, there are some people who are going to find, and I think in these kind of graphic notations, it's a margin, it's a very small group. It's, I'm noticing, inhabited by a lot of people, but it's still, it's definitely a minority, but that's okay. So not everyone's gonna be interested in my activity books, as it were, and I think that's cool. And just the same way some people uh, would rather pick up a hockey stick and other people would rather pick up a tennis racket. Those appeal to different players. So, um, so then we have this notion uh, in reference, um, that David referenced the notion of Boulez referring to his pieces as both mazes and maps of cities. And my daughter graduated from mazes to activity books, because I actually graduated in a sort of celebratory sense of like maze and pejorative in that. The maze is teleologic, it has a, a goal. This is where I get back to rules are not rules are not rules. And um, whereas the, the city map, in a sense, is a, a space of possibility, a space of, of personal discovery and experience, um, or, the, or I should say the city is a space for that. So to pull things together, I just have maybe two more thoughts here with this. Um, the, uh, Lauren said, this, she quoted Guy Debord, and said, who said, the study of precise laws and specific effects of the geographical environment consciously organized. And I was thinking about that, that geographical environment. It could be a venue, it could be an installation, but it really could be the score itself. And the score is consciously organized, whether that's a kind of con conventional notation system or some sort of glyphs. And with all of this, it started to make, make me think of a continuum. This will be my sort of last thing. And this is kind of harebrained, but I'd like to talk to somebody about it who can help me with this. If you imagine this notionally autonomous space all the way to one end of the uh, continuum, the, the, the paradigm of the, the perfect Beethoven's fifth rendering that, that exists off the page, then I think of the religious labyrinth in which there are no choices, at least in the sort of uh, physical sp space. You follow a line, right? And then I think of the maze, which has choices, which has possibilities, okay? But it still has a pretty specifically narrow goal. You're supposed to find the exit or something. Then I think of games, games which have rules, and you need to abide by those rules, okay? But you think of like basketball as a game where so much of the joy is aesthetic and is outside of the mere rules. You have to get the ball in the basket, and you can't double dribble and so forth. You gotta say in bounds. But how that's actually accomplished is subject to, I mean, and we love like, oh, that was a cool dunk, or that was this kind of alley play, or whatever. 
And so there's all these aesthetics that are variable. Okay, so this is becoming, in a sense, more indeterminate, even though they abide by the rules. Then we get an installation or a kind of fully open score, but it's still subject to specific effects. Those, you know, that space was prescribed, determined by the composer that were. And then finally, I put the city map um, as a, a description of an extant phenomenon, that is the city itself, as being this really open space that doesn't have rules. We don't say how we're supposed to live one's life in that city, but we still inhabit that space. I mean, there are geographical effects that impose how we operate there. And it makes me wonder if we kind of come full circle to sort of like some of, say, Alvin Lussier's piece, pieces, which are, in a sense, some, some of them, I think, approach the description of a phenomenon, the description of a space, the acoustic of a space. In a way, they have this sort of like, um, uh, some sort of sense of a truth that's being revealed about a space. Um, again, that was a little bit harebrained, but maybe over some drinks we can discuss more. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, we are now running between three and ten minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, and rather than between three and five, and at this rate, we will not we will not continue. <laughs> so that's all right. Uh, I, that's just uh, I, if the shoe fits, we're hurt. Um, so, Paula Matheson, you, you, you're our next speaker. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not known for my loquaciousness, so... Good. Get <laughs> all um, <laughs> average, I do <laughs> um, um, I will just talk a little bit about the piece tonight, which was written for um, the vocal constructivists, and uh, I was invited by Jane to do this, and I was so excited for it. And um, the piece is called In Words of One Syllable, and where the title comes from, is a series of books that were published um, in the 1900s, like you know, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, where what they would do is they would take these books, like big uh, classic texts, um, and then to make them easier uh, for people to read and learn, they would reduce um, all the writing to be words that were exactly one syllable in length. And so this would be things for like Alice in Wonderland and stuff like that. And the particular book that I had that I received from my aunt, who coincidentally was a librarian, um, was uh, the Swiss, Swiss Family Robinson, which you can't even actually say the title of the book using the <laughs> words of one syllable. So all these really weird idiosyncratic things happen, like major names of characters are changed and other things like that. And so I found out that the ensemble affectionately referred to it as Swiss Clan Bob, which I love. <laughs> but, um, but so I was thinking about this in terms of this uh, relationship, in terms of like, you know, notate the notations that we pick up um, as, as a way as part of this process of learning and what these systems are that we make for ourselves in, in these sort of relationships. And uh, you know, for a lot of times when I think about the process of learning music notation for myself, um, part of it was this feeling of, um, it was sort of kind of shrouded in this sort of guise of universality. Whereas um, when I started really working very closely with performers, a lot of people who I developed very close relationships with, um, the notation actually ended up through that process becoming so much more idiosyncratic. And um, this is part of why I like the idea of, of notation and of being bound up in these social processes. And um, it's something that I find that uh, is very much interwoven in a lot of my work uh, to varying degrees, uh, depending on the relationship with the performance and the ensemble. Thank you.